by way of a reminder to everyone, we are all, uh, or most of us probably, are of the oil and gas industry. So we understand the importance of safety in our day-to-day -day operations. We want to remind us that um, we are still very much in the middle of the COVID pandemic. And as such, we are encouraged to constantly wash our hands, avoid handshaking, make sure you use a face mask, and as much as possible, when you are not with family members, avoid hugging. No hugs or kisses are allowed just yet. As soon as we are completely out of the pandemic, we'll be able to return to pre-pandemic mode of life. But at this point, please continue to stay safe, keep yourself safe, and make sure that everyone around you is also safe. As far as um, the safety movement is concerned, make sure that wherever you are, you can hear the sound of any alarm that is supposed to be triggered in the event of an emergency. Always remember the locations for fire alarms, where the extinguishers are located, where exactly your emergency exits are, and the muster points for your buildings. The building name, the floor number, and the room number should be something that you keep in your head, just in case something is happening exactly where you are, you are not caught in a confused state. Also know what the alarm sounds like, so you don't mistake the honking of a car, probably, for the alarm in your office building. It is important that you keep this to mind and be ready in the event that there is an emergency. No one plans for it, but it is called an emergency for a reason. So we should always be prepared. Always be prepared. With that, we're going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is the introduction of eminent dignitaries that are part of this meeting this morning. To kickstart the introduction, I would like to recognize with, with special appreciation, the president of the National Association of Petroleum Explorationists. I'm talking about Mrs. Patricia Ochobo. Mrs. Patricia is here in this meeting. I would like to appreciate her. Thank you very much, madam, for being here. The vice president, John Bosco Uche, is also here in this meeting. We thank you for coming. We appreciate your presence. The immediate past president of NAPE, talking about Alex Taka, is here in this meeting. We want to appreciate your presence. Also here this morning, the member of the advisory council, we want to appreciate Dr. Victor Gujofo. Also here this morning, we have the president-elect, Dr. James Edet, is here in this meeting this morning. You can agree with me that it's quite a loaded meeting. Thank you very much, everyone, of you for coming. We appreciate your presence. The Benin chapter that has graciously put together this program is ably coordinated by Mr. Edward Oza, he's the chapter coordinator. He's of the Nigerian Petroleum Development Company. He's ably assisted by Mr. Ugochuku Ogamba, who is of the Integrated Data Services Limited, also in Benin. He is the deputy chapter coordinator. Mr. Izundu Ipo of the MPDC is the general secretary, while the assistant general secretary also of the MPDC is Mr. Inemeset Udo. The Financial Secretary, Mr. Danlami Bauer, and the Public Relations Officer, Mr. Jeffrey Jayola. We want to especially also acknowledge the other executive members of NAPI Benin chapter. We have Mr. Amin Shehu, who is also of NPDC and uh, Mr. Steven Saku of IDSL. He's also a chapter ex officio. Want to appreciate every one of you for taking your time to put together this very important technical meeting. Also present in this meeting are fellows of the National Association of Petroleum Explorationists. Want to appreciate with thanks the presence of uh, Victor Agbe Davis. Thank you very much, sir, for being part of this meeting. We appreciate you.
Also, we have the publicity secretary, the national publicity secretary, Mr. Tumbosu is also in the meeting. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate everyone who is here, who has not been mentioned and those that have been mentioned. We are hopeful that today we're gonna to have a very important and insightful session. We would like to quickly set the ground rules for this meeting as we start into the technical aspects of it. Please, you are encouraged to constantly mute your microphone, ensure that your, my, um, your cameras are turned off. And if there are questions that we, you would want to ask, please type them in the chat section. It is important that you type them as the presentation is going on so that the Q&A can come swift and fast as soon as the presentation is over. We encourage you to start your questions with a brief introduction that tells us your name and your affiliations. Also, how related you are to NAPI. It will be important for us so that we can collate them while we go on to the Q&A session. Once again, please remember to mute your microphones, turn off your cameras, and please, if you're not talking, you do not need to put on the microphone. For this technical meeting of the month of May, we have the chairman's opening remarks. This is going to be taken by the manager data acquisition department of the Integrated Data Services Limited here in Benin. I would like to welcome to quickly give us his opening remarks and the introduction of the presenter of the day. Please let's welcome Dr. Latunde Akintola. Dr. Latunde Akintola, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I feel privileged and honored to be the chairman of this occasion. And uh, the, this Benin chapter, I mean, the technical meeting uh, will be featuring uh, Dr. Thomas Appan Harry, a PhD holder and the head of department of the Aqua Ebom State University of the geology department. That is the head of department of geology. Um, I know uh, he, he has PhD, MSc and PhD in uh, petroleum geology and uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, micropaleontology respectively. And he has worked, he has a career that has spanned both in the international public service, private sector, and Currently, he is the head of the department of the geology department of Aquaba State University, as we said. And he has published many papers in international journals, 26 papers on the, I mean, and uh, he has also uh, presented many papers in international conferences. And his uh, area of interest is currently, his current area of interest is in sequenced stratigraphy of the West African basins. And he manages the EMP workstations in the university where both undergraduate, undergraduate and postgraduate students are trained. And that is in the geology department of the university. So he's currently the general secretary of the Nigerian Association of Petroleum Explorationists the, of the Uyo Calabar chapter and a member of the Africa, I mean, American Association of Petroleum Geoscientists. He is an associate editor of the NAPE Global Bulletin and is married to Dorothy, a chemical engineer, and they have three children. Yes, that's about the introduction of the speaker. I, we, I mean, seeing the, uh, the, education and the working experience of the Dr. Thomas Harry. We, I know we are all expectant as professionals to that he would deliver justice, but the topic is about to make a presentation on, which is the high resolution prospect evaluation, pros, the concepts, methodology, and case study. He will be coming up with some case study from the southeastern part of the Niger Delta. And 
we know uh, as geoscientists, we are expected to make use of information we gather from uh, subsurface images, from well data, from seismic data to reconstruct the history or the earth history of a geological basin and to be able to identify those areas that are highly prospective for oil and gas accumulations. Uh, there are the conditions, we, we, we look at certain things, there are characteristics we look for, those uh, conditions that favor the generation and the accumulation of the oil and gas. And uh, in this study, is going to treat us to the use of uh, to, to, to how uh, you can uh, the, the use of integrated uh, integrated. I mean, using the uh, 3D seismic data as well as uh, well data in an integrated way for you to identify uh, oil and gas prospectivity of the area. And having done that, he was able to come up with two reservoirs, uh, P0.5 and P0, P1, which are, found, which are all in Agbada formation and are found to be oil and gas bearing. The, he also did a sequence, sequence stratigraphy, conducted sequence stratigraphy studies on the, using the well and seismic sessions to characterize the depositional environment. And uh, some stratigraphic markers in that environment were, were identified, such as uh, uh, Kwaibo, Agula unconformity, the onlap and maximum flooding surface, transgressive surface, sequence boundary, and reservoirs. He was able to identify and delineate these ones and uh, Structural closures were also, I mean, the structural closures were evaluated and they were found to be good for hydrocarbon accumulation. So uh, I'm happy, uh, I think, um, like I said, I feel honored to chair this occasion. And no doubt we are expecting, we are all uh, expecting much to, from uh, Dr. Thomas Harry. Uh, he, 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 it will no doubt we will all gain a lot from this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, as far as introduction. That's how I mean. That's as far as uh, my my experience. That's how far I will go. Thank you very much. Can we move on to? Uh, well, I know we have speak. Uh, we have, yes. Can we move on to the presentation now? Yeah, we are. We can see the presentation on the screen. I hope your microphone is not muted. That is uh, Dr. Uh, Ari. I hope your micro, my, your mic is not muted. Chair. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, everyone, for the opportunity, especially the the chapter coordinator and members of NAPED in the beginning chapter for the opportunity. Um, I want to also use this opportunity to thank the NAPED National, the president, and every other person that is in this meeting. 
I want to believe that um, at the end of this meeting, we'll be able to share ideas, get contributions, and also enrich ourselves. I, I am also learning as well. I believe your contributions will even add knowledge to me. So once again, thank you. Just like the topic says, high resolution prospect evaluation concept, methodology, and case studies. Um, in this work, it looks like the slide is freezing. All right, in this work, uh, slightly, I'm gonna go through the introduction. The aim of this technical meeting is to outline the concepts and methodologies applied in a high resolution exploration process. And I will be looking at um, business analysis, the PS elements, uh, the petroleum system elements and processes, basin petroleum and petroleum system modeling workflow. And we'll also be looking at the play fair analysis workflow, you know, the prospects evaluation workflow. And there's some basic questions we want to answer at the end of the day, which are, is there any oil? Where's the oil? How much is there? And how much can we get out? Is it worth it? And uh, we're using uh, a case study from the Southeastern Niger Delta Basin to illustrate some of the things that we need to do. All right, I think I'll go to the next slide. So basically, um, we're looking at the concepts. Um, a sedimentary basin is basically a depression filled with sedimentary rocks. And uh, you know, a petroleum system is basically the accumulation of economic volumes of petroleum. I was talking about oil and gas in the subsurface, which requires several essential geological elements and processes to be present at specific time and space. You know, in um, looking at um, the, the basin or trying to get to your prospect, you start with analyzing your sedimentary basins and then you move to identify the petroleum systems in place and then move to the level of the play, then identify the leads and the potential prospects. When you have the presence of these three elements, the source, reservoir and sea rock, then you are, you know, on the way to getting a lead. And then probably after the evaluation, you're on the way to getting a fantastic prospect. And so there are elements that must be identified, you know, for you to say that you have a prospect or you have a petroleum system. And this includes the source rock, the reservoir rock, the sea rock, and the overburden rock. The other geological processes that you have to study and evaluate um, to see whether you have a reasonable opportunity within your prospects. And that includes the trap formation, the carbon generation and migration, and the accumulation. So it's, it's a matter of moving from the known to the unknown. Uh, the sedimentary basin can consist of multiple uh, petroleum systems. And you can have the petroleum system consisting of multiple plays, and the plays consisting of multiple prospects, as you can see. You know, uh, this is play A, and then you have some prospects around. So the petroleum system can consist of one or more multiple plays. Um, now, I, I, the express uh, process is a very risky business with many uncertainties. And so the risk can be alleviated by employing the science and engineering technology. And that means that we are looking at integration of you know, uh, geophysics, structural geology, sedimentology, and stratigraphy, geochemistry. And then we're also looking at uh, modeling the geochemistry, uh, the maturation of the hydrocarbons, petrophysics. Uh, also, we need to work with the drilling technologies and the reservoir technology to get uh, some a good level of certainty and the risk the prospect. Uh, this diagram here shows that if, if you're going to do or drill a well, you know, um, to identify a possible prospect, you would need to drill 120 wells before you can find one. If you don't use 
these geosciences, these studies. When you add geophysics, you can move up to 28%. And when you add geochemistry and geophysics with other uh, uh, studies, you can move from 63 upwards. And so these studies from Peters and Fowler 2002. This shows uh, a generalized um, workflow for the uh, basin analysis or the, the exploration process. So you start from the larger picture, which is the basin, and then move through to the petroleum system evaluation. You do your play fairway analysis, and then you map your lead and prospect, and then of course, uh, your the carbon charge, and then of course, get down to your prospect volumes. And then after that, you carry out uh, uh, your risk analysis to know whether it's something that you can invest in. And then of course, furthermore, with your economic analysis, before you define your building strategy. Okay, in the basin analysis, let's start with that. What you're looking for is basically the regional studies of wherever you want to carry out the exploration. And so you will have to summarize the historic history of the region with particular respect to development of the study basin. And you have to define the mega sequence that comprise the regional stratigraphic framework. You will also need to define the regional important structural trends, and then establish the stratigraphic framework of the area. So this regional study has to be done, and some non-geophysical methods like gravity and magnetics could be very helpful, you know, during this kind of work. Uh, you also have to establish your structural framework. Where is the basement? What kind of highs and lows? What are the structures? What, are, what kind of form do you have within the basement? And so these are some of the things that helps you to establish the structural trends. You know, a lot of them are published in the literature and, then, and so it could be very helpful. One method that is very useful is seismic. Seismic methods are the most widely used in oil and gas exploration. It is the only method capable of imaging the subsurface, providing information, you know, in a recognizable and separable three-dimensional uh, pattern, talking about the X, Y, and Z. Now, with seismic, or what, let me say, other geological methods, we, when added extensively, will give you information about structural geometry, heterogeneity, and temperature. But with seismic, uh, if indirectly supported, probably with the petrophysics, you'll be able to get the first rock occurrences, Reservoir occurrences, reservoir quality, geomechanical properties, and, and pressure. Now, where do we start from? Normally, for seismic, I'll be talking about the seismic, uh, petrophysics, geochemistry, and you know, if integrated, the kind of value that you have. You know, so where do you start from? You need to understand the subsurface geology and identify potential hydrocarbon traps. And a process seismic data comes with three main outputs. One is the arrival time, the geometry, amplitude, and frequency of the reflected wave. You know, and so you would need to do different kinds of interpretation, which include structural interpretation, stratigraphic interpretation, attribute analysis, and seismic inversion. And then uh, first, you have to, assuming you're starting uh, a portfolio, you want to start in, um, interpreting, you will need to build your database. And for you to do that, you need to review the data and then QC the data and validate the data. You know, so supporting data, for instance, the regional geology and all of that, textual data, well bore data, and well data has to be QC appropriately. And then uh, you now do your structural interpretation, uh, the horizon interpretation, fault interpretation, and job bodies, such as steels, dikes, and metals. You know, in some cases, you could have some steels, some diapers, diaphragmic structures, anticline, and so on. So it's important for you to define all of this. A successful structure, a structural interpretation requires good quality seismic uh, data, knowledge of the regional trends, well data, and a good software. Like in this work, I use petrol. You know, uh, so for for you, for the size, for the structural interpretation, you probably want to start with tying your your wells 
the, your seismic well data with the, the section you spell, or your borehole data with seismic. Uh, this is a key process, any seismic interpretation, because it helps to calibrate uh, you know, the, the well data with the seismic data. This allows you to understand what is what in a more accurate and controlled manner. And for you to do this, you will need your density and sonic logs, of course, and then generate a wavelength to get the synthetic size of it. This is an example of uh, a seismic well time. You know, you're correlating what you're seeing in the wireline wells and then uh, what you see on the size to give you uh, some kind of a, a picture that you need for your interpretation. Now, there are certain uncertainties that can uh, lead to erroneous interpretation, so it's important for you to do your QC. Uh, thereafter, you, you, you take over your, uh, you do your horizon of false speaking, uh, quite a tedious job, and those methods aligned there uh, are the ones that are used, uh, basically. And then after that, you, know, you do your grids and then plot your maps, uh, and uh, begin your interpretation. So for the horizon of fault picking, there are different guidelines. It's better to pick off the zero crossing and then also consider regional trends. Watch out for the size and specific it may be laborious, but it's important for you to be led to observe the specific character and so on and so forth. And then after that, you do your mapping and contouring using the defined contouring rules, you know, which is listed there. All right, so when you finish all of that, it's important for you to begin to evaluate your petroleum system, your petroleum system. And one way of doing this, you know, is, let, let me talk about this now. Let me just go straight to petrophysics because you're done with your seismics. Petrophysics is also very important. Um, and it's the study of physical and chemical characteristics of rocks and the fluids interaction. The responsibility of the physicists is to define the information tops, lithology types, net reservoir porosity, saturation, fluid contact, the salt factor, pressure profile, and capability estimation. There's a method that is always also underestimated, which is geochemistry. It's important for you to have inputs from chemistry because it will give you uh, the timing of units and then the tectonic event, especially in something like uh, when the traps are formed and all of that, it also helps you to calibrate the maturity of your source rocks. So geochemistry is very important, especially when integrated with other methods. All right, now let's begin to look at the evaluation of the petroleum system, which you mentioned including the source rock. So we'll start with the source rock. Now, what is a source rock? Source rock is basically uh, an organic rich rock, uh, rich in perogen. And of course, most of those rocks are formed in anoxic conditions. You know, where you have high levels of hydrogen and the oxygen is, is uh, excluded. And so typically shell is a good source. There are different kinds of domains. And that's why the Study of your depositional environment is so important. And then, you know, I talked about perogen. You know, most of the source rocks uh, uh, have the, the total minerals include perogen. Uh, and a part of that perogen, so about 10 to 20 percent, contains the soluble inorganic solvent, Abhya, uh, which is bitumen. And uh, bitumen is rich in aspartins and resins and aromatic hydrocarbons. So this Bitumen, when subjected to temperature and, and pressure at the appropriate depth, gives birth to your hydrocarbon. You know, and talking about the reservoir and steel rock. Basically, you know, your reservoir rock must have two major properties. It must have good porosity and the ability to transmit fluids, sustainability. And so um, very good. Reservoir rocks are found in sandstones, you know, around the world. It's, it's also limestones can act as good reservoir rocks, especially in some of the reservoirs you have in the river countries. And so it's important for you to understand your deposit environment and the processes, the geometry and the lateral extent of connectivity of the reservoirs, and also the properties, which include 
Gross porosity, you know, net to gross permeability, and so on, for you to say, oh, um, I'm de risking my, my portfolio. Now, another process, we just talked about the different elements. It's important to, to also understand the petroleum system processes, what happens within the petroleum system. And this includes your trap formation, your, you need to be able to understand the kind of traps you have, are they structural, are they, uh, are they stratigraphic traps? And then your migration path also has to be studied. Looking at this, uh, you will see that when the oil is manufactured in the kitchen and the shell it migrates through defined migration paths, you have two kinds of migration, the primary migration and the secondary migration. The primary migration is when you have the oil and gas migrate from the source rock into the reservoir. And then it takes a second journey from the reservoir, you know, and probably gets stopped by either a seal and trap. But if it's not stopped, it continues to migrate. From studies, it's been seen that, you know, around the world, 1%, only 1% of migrated hydrocarbon is stored in traps. 49% about that is it migrates and then appears as seepages and seeps in some places, while 50% is locked up in, in shells. That's why some companies are able to frack the shells and, um, and then uh, bring out the oil. And so this shows a, a process flow of what happens. Now, on a generic value, these are some of the things you need to look out for when you're evaluating your petroleum system. For the source rock, the thickness, area extent, you know, connectivity, must be understood. The corrosion type also must be documented. You know, you have different current types. The one is, uh, the type one is lacustrine, is oil prone. Type two is oil and gas prone. Uh, the type three is gas prone. Type four is inert and uh, would not generate any kind of um, oil or gas. So you also have traps and the things that are required, you know, for the reservoir, you, you, the technology has to be studied distribution of the reservoir rocks, the quality of the reservoir rocks, and also the timing and migration is very important. You need to understand when the oil was generated and when the entrapment was done, when the traps were formed, because if the traps were formed, you know, before the generation of the oil, then you're going to have a pool. But if the trap was formed after the generation of the oil, then you're not going to have a pool because the oil generated will migrate. A very important um, event chart is required, you know, for you to be able to speculate or make a, a decision, you know, to say, oh, this particular prospect will give um, oil and gas. So that's what we call the petroleum system event chart. This chart demonstrates, you know, you put it across the jolly time scale. And of course, this way your biostratigraphy is very important you know, because without stratigraphy, you're able to date the rocks. And it's also very important in sequence stratigraphy. And you put all your elements against the time. And also the critical moment is very important because this one documents the entrapment, the generation entrapment and the time that the, the, the trap was formed. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, if the trap was formed after the generation of the carbon, you're most likely to be working with very high uncertainties at this time. And though you'll be dealing at the level of hypothetical and speculative assessment. When you do all of that and create all your maps for the reservoirs, the seal rocks, and all the petroleum elements, it would not be time for you to, con con you know, to put them together, overlap them to form a composite map. This composite map will help you to rank you know, your prospect, whether it is, you know, high risk, medium risk, or low risk. You know, when you have all of them coinciding, then you're dealing with a low risk, low, low risk. But when you have one or two of the elements compromised, then you're gonna have a high risk prospect. Now, my case study is taken from Harris Field, the Southeastern uh, Niger Delta Basin. And uh, this um, the data, um, was quite interesting. Uh, you know, Niger Delta Basin, of course, is a prolific basin. 
in Nigeria, where most of the oil and gas is taken from. And then uh, we first had the deposition of Benin formation. And then you also have uh, that during the Pleistocene Holocene. Sorry, first you had the deposition of Akata formation during the Eocene Middle Miocene, and the deposition of the Paralic Agbada formation during the Upper Miocene, Pleiocene, and then of course the Benin formation, caps of the basin. And then, um, as a matter of fact, um, this shows you a, a little bit of history of the basin. Uh, we also have uh, in the Illegal scene, you had the Briafra member of the Agbada Formation, it's a typical uh, reservoir. And then you had diaperism take place in the basin between um, EOC and uh, um, middle Illegal scene. Of course, this shell diapers as a result of overburden pressure from the Agbada Formation on uh, all concentrated cell, shell materials. And then we also have a record of these regional unconformity. And then after that, you had the fiber member and uh, the, the position of the bidding information. Um, uh, some data um, we used included just this size, well data, pressure data, division data, and then we used it to uh, do a fault interpretation, carrying out the seismic tie, and uh, did, we did a stratigraphic correlation, and so on. These are the final products, the time and uh, and depth maps. We also did some petrophysical studies as well as geo recommendations after identifying the source. And so this just gives us the characteristics of the seismic data. And it was a 3D seismic with a coverage of 369 kilometers squared with the following inline and coastline ranges. The time range was zero to 5,000 milliseconds. And uh, we also carried out um, uh, a QC um, we did the variance method to improve the quality of the seismic to see the faults very well. And then we also did uh, some realization to have a good um, display. This part of the QA we, we did for the logs. Some of the logs had good and available data and um, some were not available in some wells. Some logs were not available in some wells. So for those ones, they're not useful. All right, so um, we also have some paid core data um, to relate with the borehole. But unfortunately, that particular world did not have an ecological law, so we didn't do much with it, except for interpreting the, the positional environment. And then uh, for the pressure data, we used it for feed discrimination. And then uh, a check shot was used to, uh, for velocity function and uh, generate a synthetic seismic. You know, oh, 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 this is um, the, the seismic well time that we did for that field. And uh, we're able to recognize the shell depth at two on the seismics. And you know, this is the cross section of this. You know. And so uh, we noticed that um, we also had some faults. And um, you know, so this is the area of interest, you know, the area that was highly faulted. You know, after carrying out our fault analysis, we recognized um, two major faults, antithetic and synthetic faults, which um, were associated with a regional fault that was trending northeast southwest. And uh, the common indicator, uh, there's a flat spot here, you know, a flat spot is always representative of uh, free contracts. And so these are some of the things that we found on the seismics. And then uh, we also found some nice structures. Uh, there's a gravel structure and the whole structures here. And we recognize that you know, most of the wells that um, were penetrated within this field you know, fell within this um, whole structure, so meaning that it was quite a prospective area. We didn't have very uh, enough data uh, for this work, but with the data we had, we were able to uh, migrate and uh, I mean, uh, study, see some prospects, and then try to establish um, some of the prospective areas. Now, this is the, the false sticks, and then we did, we did a false framework, you know, um, because we understand that uh, when you have forward closures and you have
This one shows the area of interest and the faults within the area of interest. And then this is the uninterpreted section, yeah, time slice okay, 1350, and the interpreted section. Now we also carried out the horizon interpretation and uh, we put the framework on the horizon of the, the reservoir P05 and P01, which were the major reservoirs that we delineated. And then uh, we also did uh, what I would call, you know, we, we, we actually tried to define the, the boundary or the fault. We saw a major fault trending northeast southwest, which is this fault here. Uh, these other ones with the associated faults, which was trending in this other direction. Some of them were trending in that direction. So we also did our correlations uh, after flattening the wells. We did and then mapped out the the potential um, reservoirs. You know, this high resistivity is an um, indicator of the presence of hydrocarbon. And then when we did as a well seismic tie in some of the wells. Uh, after correlating across, we saw some um, correlation, you know, some conformities. For instance, the PO5 reservoir uh, coincided with the Biafra sands. And also we were able to pick our, fall, our seal here, uh, um, which also correlated with uh, one of the members that we talked about before, the Pibo seal. And so we had that correlation with the ones, what we saw on the logs. And then of course, this high resistivity, you know, is also informative of our presence of Atacom. And then we also carried out a sequence stratigraphic study. We noticed that most of the reservoirs fell within the low stand system tracks of the Biafra member of Agbada formation. And this is the seismic stratigraphy of that study we're able to track the, the major unconformity and also see the, the, uh, the, the, hoist and, uh, the hoist structures and the gravel structure. You know, this is the, uh, the, the, up, the up deep area where this, this is the erosional area. And then, so that's the picture I just showed initially. After that, we did uh, time maps and also defined the different prospects in the area. with the structures in mind. This is a prospective area and this one, and they have shown very clearly in the next slide. So we had uh, accumulation of gas in the B1 structure and the accumulation of oil and gas in the AXY structure. And then we also have the P1 structure and uh, that saw oil and gas as well. And so we carried out amplitude extraction, uh, especially for the area of interest. And we saw that, you know, two major uh, reservoirs, you know, had the attributes, the uh, anomaly conforming to structure, which indicates the presence of hydrocarbon. And so uh, we also carried out um, the pressure analysis to be able to discriminate the gas, the, the gas oil contacts and the water contacts. And then this also coincided with a trend on the maps. Um, we did the petrophysical analysis uh, using the standard methodology for porosity, water saturation, and net gross. And these were the results that we had. And so um, the petrophysical properties showed that, you know, well, L1 had the highest net gross, porosity was highest in B1, which is one of the prospects that we had. And then the sat water saturation was lowest in A5X and highest in A8X. And that's the picture for reservoir P1. We also did uh, gas pit thickness, the oil pit thickness, and these are the results. All right, after that, we attempted a volume estimation and uh, we plotted the depth against the area to be able to have the, our uh, gross um, rock volume. And then we use the standard formula for stack tongue oil in place to calculate the, the reserves um, in place. You know, from what we saw from the analysis we had, these are just the summaries of the volumes that we had. I'll just go straight to the summary. 
for the major compartments, which is the B1 and A5X. All right, so now um, the B1 uh, found a lot of gas, and then that's about 664 million SCL, standard cubic feet of gas, while the P PO5 found this. And then for the AX5, you know, found majorly oil and there was no gas. Now, after that, we did our risk uh, assessment. You know, it's important for whenever you do your volumetrics, you need to the risk uh, to see, is it something that fetches oil? I mean, what are the levels of uncertainties? And so we rank them, you know, uh, you know, against 100%, this is in decimal anyway. So for the, the source rock, good quality, Akata source rock, good quality, we gave one. And then for the quality is what we scored. And then for the containment, 70%. And then the trap, um, the mapping of the trap, good structural, uh, good structure, so we gave 80%. But for the timing of migration, because we didn't have uh, geochemical data, uh, we could not determine um, some of the uh, important variables for maturity and so on. So there was no way. So I just gave that 0 0.4. In conclusion, hydrocarbon was found within the field of study and in the upper Miocene, and the strap tiles were basically fault closures and stratigraphic traps. There were about eight new prospects identified. I want to thank Nape Bilin Chapter for the opportunity. Uh, to make this presentation. I believe that in the deliberations, I'll have one or two things to learn. And also want to thank NAPI UAP for their impact in the university system and AAPG as well, you know, the Imperial Award, uh, Barrel Awards. A lot of trainings have been going on. I want to thank Exxon Mobile for giving us workstations. Uh, it's been so useful. In fact, I think that you're beginning to close the gap between you know, the industry and the university system. Also, I want to thank Sloan Bridget for the petrol licenses and Akawa State University for the opportunity, especially the Department of Geology, and my colleagues, Carlos, Epefre, and Ho, who were part of the, the, this work. Reference. Thank you for listening, and God bless. Thank you very much, Dr. Harry, for the exhaustive and very informative presentation. Everyone will agree with me that this has been dealt with very extensively. And um, by way of moving forward, like I said earlier, we would have time for questions and answers. And that is the part that we have now come on to. We had asked that people put their questions right there in the chat box. So if your questions are ready, we are now here to take them. Dr. Harry will be here listening to the questions and we will have answers for every one of them at the end of collation. So if you have received any questions, we will be bringing them up. If you're still to write yours, please don't hesitate to put them right there in the chat box. Yeah, before you move on to the question and answers, shouldn't there be a, a recap? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think there should be a recap and uh, just as a way of recap or summary. Yeah, that's fine, sir. Um, yeah. yeah an fine. area was studied in the southeastern Niger Delta using essentially 3D seismic and well data from seven wells. And um, they were able also to get uh, the log, the call, the call logs. But then the call logs was not so much use, useful because they didn't have the lithologic data. So, but they were able to, from the well, 3D well data, I mean the 3D seismic data and the well data, they were able to do uh, synthetic uh, uh, seismogram that is doing seismic well tie 
Then from there, they were able to do some correlations along across the different wells. Uh, we were able to map out uh, the different uh, uh, sand bearing horizons. And uh, they carried out some pressure analysis and petrophysical analysis to be able to go on to doing volumetrics, uh, calculating the volumes of oil and gas uh, in the field. So that's essentially uh, what I would say that I think summarized the work done. And um, yeah, again, we, we know, I mean, as usual in the uh, petroleum system, we know that the source rock is from Makata and the reservoir rocks are in uh, Agbada formation. And they were able to identify some other important strategic feed markers there within the study area. So that to me seems to be the, I will summarize, that, will, that looks to me as a short summary of what the, of the work done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Akitola for the recap. I want to believe that um, Dr. Harry had done so much um, exhaustive teaching to the extent that everyone is perfectly understood what has been taught because up until now we haven't seen any questions. So I think it's kudos to Dr. Harry for a job well done. It's so clear that uh, people do not have gray areas that we want clarifications on. At this time, we will uh, move to, okay, I'm being, I'm being told that some questions have come into the chat room. So if you'll give me a moment to quickly look at them. Okay, there's a question from Abdullahi. Uh, we had said that people should tell us their affiliation so we could, um, by way of um, understanding exactly where the question is coming from, but this is from Abdullahi and it says, is it possible to detect the fault that has not been juxtaposed using seismic? Considering the fact that there is no much acoustic difference between the hanging and the foot wall. Is it possible to detect the fault that has not been juxtaposed using seismic, considering the fact that there is no there's no much acoustic acoustic difference between the hanging and the foot wall? Yeah, it, uh, it, it is possible. Uh, like I told you, we use the, uh, the variance uh, method to, to to enrich the size. You know, it's important that uh, you carry out some. You know, put control to be able to see that there are faults and uh, the, the, the acoustic impedance different wasn't so much. It's not that the seismic quality was not so good. Thank you very much, Doctor. I hope that answers Abdullahi's questions. Um, barring any further questions, I would like to invite the public relations officer of the Benin chapter of NAPE for general announcements. Please, um, I welcome Mr. Jeffrey Jayola. Thank you so much, Deja. Thank you, uh, President and um, uh, the other distinguished members of NAPI who are at the meeting. And um, thank you again, Doctor, for a wonderful presentation. <clears throat> and um, thank you for those that did to ask the questions. So for Benin chapter, we... We've been having a technical meeting. We're happy to announce today that today for this uh, session, as at the last time we clocked, uh, we had already 56 members in participation at this uh, May technical meeting. So, um, that's um, okay, an update, yes, going, 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 yes, 59, yes, three pulled out. Thank you so much. And um, for our activity, we want to remind you that um, the NAPI conference is um, it's coming in soon and there's the early bird registration. So 
you do get some discounts if you register on time. And for those that probably are submitting papers, the deadline for your submission is um, in June. Yeah, so we're having a, we on the, in the Benin side, we did an active uh, membership drive and we were able to get a lot of uh, new entrants into Benin. So very soon, yes, we probably will be boasting of the largest uh, representation in the whole of, is it, apologies to Dr. here. Yes, we are still going to put you guys. So um, essentially that's a wrap for activities for Benin. Uh, we're going to push up to 80 from our early trainees and uh, we are hoping to still recruit more from the schools. Um, thank you for your time here and thank you again. Um, I hand over back to Deji. All right, Jeff, thanks for the announcements. Very succinctly put. Um, this time we'll be going for the closing remarks. Votes of thanks, and there's no better person than the national president of NAPE to give the vote of thanks and closing remarks. So please join me welcome Mrs. Patricia Uchogu for the closing remarks and vote of thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for all to all that uh, tuned in uh, to today's presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, the presenter, Dr. Harry. You did an excellent job in reminding us of what we need to do to get excellent results. I will just uh, add a bit of an announcement before I close. Uh, before I say the closing, and that's to remind you all that the um, voting and um, the um, well. Sorry, that um, nominations are being solicited uh, for the elect elective positions that are open for the positions of uh, president elect, for the position of vice president, and for the position of UAP chairman. Um, the um, nomination period has been extended to June 11. So please uh, look into it and see what you can do because volunteerism is the bedrock of our service to NAPE. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who has been on this call. Uh, I'm sure we have all learned something, both the experienced and uh, the new hire. Uh, it's always a, a, a pleasure to learn something uh, because the world we are in now means that we have to be adaptive, we have to be agile, and that's the only way we can succeed in the new reality that we are getting into. And I just want to thank uh, the uh, executive and membership of uh, NAPE Benin chapter uh, for putting this together. I also thank uh, the NAPE ESCO, all of whom I've seen on this call and the um, fellows. I, I, I really want to call out uh, Victor Abbe Davis because I know for a fact that is in a different time zone. And it is the love of NAPE that will make him uh, dial in at such an odd hour for him. And to everyone, I wish you a good day. Thank you. Back to you, moderator. Thank you, Madam President, for the wonderful remarks. Thank you for thanking everyone. We also, once again, would like to thank you for the wonderful stare that you give to the association. Thank you so much, Madam. With the closing remarks, ladies and gentlemen, we have um, quietly come to the end of this technical meeting. We will be having a virtual presentation of the plaque to our presenter just shortly after this um, meeting. Um, it would have been good to have um, the, let me see, I think it would be good if we have the chapter coordinator do it while everyone is still here. What do you think? We're gonna do it, thank you. We're gonna do it right away. We'll be doing it now. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the presentation whilst uh, still in the meeting. So, Coordinator Rice and members of the executive, let's um, do the presentation. Please, we need to see your face. Dr. Jackson. On behalf of the new chapter, I present to you. 
We are not. On my own, switch on your camera, please. We are not seeing anything. The president spoke and we didn't see the president. Why are we masking everything here? Okay. That's fine. Okay, there's a petition for punishment. Journals of focus. Jeffrey, come over. Hold on, come over. Okay, so you guys wanted to make a presentation. Oh, no. Dr. Kelly, but I didn't see you there. We're just coming in. No, no, I've been around. I how would you, go, you as mask, how you would bring you mask, the whole members of your chapter for the presentation? Nobody <laughs> wants <laughs> No, 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 we are here. Just coming in alone. I'm supposed to see your executive how here. Would you, how would you mask my beloved president speaking in the dark? And we are not seeing her. So I think you, you have to go back to the presentation. <laughs> Well done, Vinny Chapter. Well done. Thank you. Well done, eh? Thank you. Well done, and thank you. Well done, eh? Well done, eh? Well, congratulations. Eh? You, 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 you tried. I tried. I did seven, no. Thank you very much, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, you. once again. We appreciate your presence. We'll be hoping that in the next very technical meeting, we'll have you all around again. Have a very wonderful afternoon, and God bless you all.